Good morning. Oh, come on, guys. Better than that. Good morning. So I'm going to make a really astute observation as I look closely at the group. I'm the only person with a jacket on. Dave, you've got a jacket on, too. I'm going to take mine off. You can take yours off, too, if you'd like, Dave. <laughs> Let's get comfortable. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, and I'll tell you why, in no small part, because I began uh, my career oh so many years ago as a hardcore developer back when it was not chic to be geek. Uh, back then, there was no pride taken in being an engineer, uh, but today it's a little different. You guys, you're building the future. Do you get that? I mean, you are building the future. I'm not saying that to be patronizing, but that's your job. That's what you're doing, right? You are creating the future. And, and part of what I want to do in the time, the short time that I've got with you, is to help you better understand some of the perspectives that are out there to help you shape that future. Now, Dave did a wonderful job of giving you this tremendously broad and encompassing view of the cloud. And you can tell from what he said, this is a rich, rich territory, right? But it's also very complicated. And part of what we need to do is simplify it uh, and make it accessible. Now, you're engineers, you're smart people, I understand that. But we've got to make it accessible because when we set a vision, we do it by setting a compass setting, right? And once you've got that compass set, it's amazing how the complicated stuff just tends to happen. It just kind of tends to happen. So I want, what I want to do is, is I want to give you that, that vision, help you to, to see into the future just far enough, and it's tough to do. I mean, none of us can do it, right? None of us are fortune tellers, but just far enough so that you can make the right adjustments based on that compass. When I was, um, when I was starting my schooling, uh, I remember at the ripe old age of, of 18 when I graduated from high school, my dad was a big time engineer. He was an electrical engineer. He worked on a lot of the early, uh, early computing days. He developed the early disk drive technologies. He worked at Honeywell. He worked at, at DEC. He did some really cool stuff. So I wanted to be an engineer as well. Uh, but I wanted to do something, as most 18-year-olds you know, want to do, something different than dad. So I was going to be a civil engineer, not a software or a hardware, but a civil engineer. And I remember I uh, actually had the, the, the gall to apply to the same school my father went to. And I got accepted, which I thought was going to just rub it in his face. I thought, this, is, this will show Dad you know, that I really am on top of the world. So I went to him with my acceptance letter. And I'll never forget this. I was talking about this just a few days ago, in fact. Uh, he denies it to this day, but I remember it so vividly. I went to him with my acceptance letter, and I said, I said, Dad, look at this. I got accepted to your alma mater. And he said, really? What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be an engineer, of course. He said, what kind of engineer? I said, civil. And he said, civil? Civil, that's the past, Tom. I said, no, it isn't that. I'm going to build bridges and skyscrapers and all kinds of big stuff. And he said, Tom, if you built the bridge, it would be beautiful. I just wouldn't want to cross it. <laughs> God's honest truth. This is, this, is my, this is my father who always told him, you know, the way he saw him. So I went to, uh, I went to, to civil engineering school with my friend Sal, who's still best friends to this day. And Sal went off to be a civil engineer. I, I didn't, obviously. But that first day of engineering school, we're in the auditorium, and the dean of engineering is giving us the lecture. The lecture, right, to scare the daylights out of all the engineering students. Big school. There were, you know, I don't know, it seemed like thousands, probably just hundreds of us in the room, but it was just, you know, an enormous room. And at one point in his lecture, he said, look at that chair. What do you see? And I, I nudged Sal, and I said, Sal, it's a chair, right? And Sal said, yeah, I think so. And he, he went on with his lecture. He said, as engineers, you do not see the world in the way that other people do. You see the world differently. And when you look at that chair, what you see are not four legs. What you see are four vectors of force. And I thought, shit. <laughs> Dad was right. <laughs> I don't want to see vectors of force. I want to see the beautiful things in the world that I create. It didn't last long in engineering school. It took me about 12 months to figure out that that was not my, my calling in life. But about 20 years later, I realized what this guy was saying. But do, you, do you get what he was saying? He was saying that you build a lens. And through that lens, you see everything in life. And if you become an engineer, whatever kind of engineer, you use that lens to define every experience in life. And you see the world that way. And here's the problem with those lenses. We're, we're proud of them, right? We take pride in them because we've built them. It's been a long, hard struggle to build those lenses. We take a lot of pride in them. But here's the problem with lenses. They get cloudy. You get cataracts in those lenses. And after a while, you think you see things clearly, and you really don't. And you really don't. And that is the perennial challenge, right? It's the human condition. 
And I can't break myself free of that, much less break you free of it. But what I can do is show you some of the indicators of how cloudy that lens is becoming. And maybe by doing that, by showing you those indicators of how cloudy that lens is becoming, it'll help you through your genius, through your brilliance, through what you're doing to build the future, to better understand what that future should look like. And I have no doubt, and I know Dave's with me 110% on this, it'll be in the cloud. That future will be in the cloud. But, you know, how many folks really know what the cloud is? You know, talk to your friends, your family. If I talk to my Aunt Olga, if Aunt Olga can figure out what the cloud is, then we've done our jobs. We're done. We can go home for the day, right? Aunt Olga, who can barely speak English. I've written eight books, and Aunt Olga loves my books, but she can't read a word. And every time I've got a new book coming out, she'll, she'll ask me, so when's it coming out, Tommy? I want to see the book. When's it coming out? At the last dinner party, I finally I had it with her. I said, Aunt Olga, it's never going to come out, but the publisher is probably going to publish it posthumously. And she said, I can't wait. Okay. When Aunt Olga, yeah, it takes a while. When Aunt Olga, when Aunt Olga gets cloud computing, we've done our job. So how many of you believe that quote that you just saw? Everything that can be invented has been invented. How many of you believe it? Don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand. Anyone believe it? Good. Thank God. Well, one person. One person does. One person does in the back of the room. So we'll talk later. We'll talk later. Um, but you know what? One brave soul, the rest of us, we don't believe it, but we act that way. We act as though all the really great stuff has already been invented. Why do we do that? Any idea? Why do we do that? Why do we act that way? Yeah, the confines are the structure we live in, the confines around us, our peers. Right? We, we've, and we've built it, by the way. So why shouldn't it be the greatest that there ever was? You know, who else could build anything greater than what we've built? It's not possible. It's not possible. Dave talked about the innovator's dilemma. That is the innovator's dilemma. The innovator's dilemma is that no one else could build it better than we've built it because we're the smartest people in the world. Yeah, you're right. But being smart does not build the future. In fact, what if I told you technology doesn't build the future? What if I were to ask you, simple question, right? What is the single word, one word I'm looking for, that best defines how we've reshaped technology and society and business over the past 200 years? What would that word be? Give me a word. Come on, work with me. What would that word be? Innovation? Oil. oil. I love it. That's a practical person. For sure oil, actually. You know, that's a, I'm going to change the slide now. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. It, it's for sure oil. What else? What else? Money. Curiosity. Intellect. Ideas. People. Freedom. Oh, these are all great words, right? Okay, let me ask the question a little different way. They're all great words, but, but let me say that I want to look forward and then look back. What single word best defines how we're going to overcome all the challenges of the future of the next 200 years? Same word. Communication. What would, communication like it. What else? Education. education absolutely. Optimism. Drucker, Peter Drucker once said to me many, many years ago, Peter Drucker, wonderful man, I was fortunate to have him for a mentor for a few years. When I first met him, you know, being a technology bigot, I said, you know, Professor Drucker, don't you believe that all the advances in this century have been because of technology? And he said, you computer people, you're so arrogant. Actually, he said, you computer people are so arrogant. It's not technology. I said, what could it be? It's education. And if you think about it, it really is our ability to educate. But that's not the word I'm looking for. If you were to plot the steepest trajectory of change you could possibly imagine, right, the steepest J-curve that's ever existed in the history of mankind, that would be a J-curve about one thing, connections, right? Your ability to connect, not just as people, but people to things, things to things, that's what's really changed the world, right? Supply chains, that's what's changed the world. Technology is all about connections. It's the connections that are changing the world. And what connections do is they change behavior. Connections change behavior. And when you think about any innovative technology, any innovative mechanism, it is a change in behavior. So I love to collect old typewriters, right? And my kids, they come into my room, my nephews, my nieces, they come into my, my office at home, I study. They look at these old typewriters, I mean, circa 1900, right? And they say, how did you ever think using that? Did you get that question? Not how did you use it. They get the mechanics. How did you think 
using that device. Well, you know, thinking happens up here. It doesn't happen out there. Sir, are you thinking on that laptop right now, or are you thinking your, in your brain? Or do you know where it, do you know where it ends? Because I don't. You're lucky. You do. I don't. I couldn't have written a single book if it were not for a computer. Because I think in the machine. Right? It's a change of behavior. It's not just a change of technology. And when you finally look back at a technology and you say, how could I ever have used that? How could I have used that typewriter? What you're really saying is, how could I have behaved a certain way? So that's what I want you to focus on. As we talk about this, I want you to focus on this notion of, of, of behavior. If I were to ask you to give me an image of the world, this is what most of you would give me. I know it already. If I were to say to you, think of an image of the world, you would think of the blue marble floating in the blackness of outer space, right? This is the icon that we have in our mind's eye when we think of the world. It's interesting. If you take a room, and you break it out into demographics, and you take the 50 and older demographic, most of them will not respond with this as their first image. I've done, for about 10 years now, research on this with thousands and thousands of people. It is incredible how consistent it is. You know what the 50 plus will come up with? This image. The image that hung in their grade school classroom. Right? The image of the, the Mercator projection map of the world, and where it says, Russia, what do you think my image says? USSR. Right. What the hell is that? Tells you how old I am. Right. Okay. Now go down the demographics, right? Go down the 30-somethings. When you ask them the question, what they think of is usually a weather map. Now hit a teenager. Hit a tween. Right? Hit an adolescent. What do you think their view of the world is? And I want you to ask this question. Just try it. Start trying it. What do you think their image of the world is when you ask them that question? Google Maps, right? Bing, whatever. I mean, this is how they see the world. So what? So what? This is the lens I'm talking about. I mean, it shapes every aspect of how we think about ourselves. This context, these confines that this young lady was talking about that cause us to believe we stand at the pinnacle of time and it couldn't get any better? It's because of this lens. So how do you change the lens? You disrupt it. There is no comfortable way to do this. And here's how you need to disrupt it. You are building the future. You've got to ask, what will my customers value even though they haven't yet experienced it yet? What will my customers value even though they haven't yet experienced it yet? Because as an engineer, your responsibility is not just to give the customer what he or she wants. Your responsibility is to figure out what they really need to accommodate the behaviors that they're experiencing. So I want to blow away four myths. That's it. Okay? And the rest of the time we've got, I want to blow away four myths. The first is the myth of invention. What we do in this industry is not invent. When we do things well, when we change behavior, we innovate. The difference is huge. It's huge. And I'll illustrate it to you. Ever watch this game? We're going to play a version of it. My version is called Real or Not Real. Recognize the resemblance? Might take a second. Yeah, OK. All right. It's, it's, it's nice to kind of see the wave go through the audience as they look at this. Um, don't have too much fun with it. Don't have too much fun with it. So here's my version of Real or Not Real. OK, I'm going to show you some devices. I love the Sky Mall catalog. Do you love the Sky Mall catalog? Right? I am not a discontented person. I've got everything I need in life. I really do. I'm a simple person. But I can't open up a SkyMall catalog and not feel unfulfilled, right? <laughs> suddenly, I need it. I never did, but suddenly, I need it. So over the years, I've collected images from the SkyMall catalog. This is the first one when I began this journey many years ago. It's a little device that attaches your laptop. It's a little laptop, so you can see it, to your steering wheel. Isn't that great? I don't know about Seattle drivers. In Boston, we're bad enough. We don't need this. This won't make us any worse as far as driving goes. Is this real or not real? What do you think? How do you say it's real? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 40 bucks, and you too can have a heads-up display in your car. Um, okay, a USB cup warmer. Plug it into your laptop. Why? It's attached to your steering wheel, by the way. Real or not real? What do you say? Yeah, who's got one? Come on. Come on. Fess up. Seriously? <laughs> Okay, it gets better. A USB toaster. Plugs into the extra USB port in the, anyone? Real or not real? Real? No, this one's a spoof, but it's a great idea. It's a great idea. You can find VC for this in a heartbeat, there's no doubt. Okay, the latest eye product, the iLoo. I love this, okay? An internet-enabled porta potty It's got 
Check it out, though. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I haven't gotten to the punchline. It's got internet enablement on the inside and on the outside. Everything okay in there? Everything's fine. <laughs> real or not real? Real. No, it's, it's not real. It's not real. <laughs> you said it with such conviction, too. You really believed it. <laughs> but it could be. The e-holster. Right? Not for guns and ammunitions, but for your PDAs and your portable keyboards, right? And your whatever. All right? Uh, go to eholster.com. You're online right now. Go ahead. Buy one. Anyone got one of these? Seriously. Yeah. I have yet to wear it through TSA security, right? Someday. Someday I will. Uh, it gets even better. This is my latest favorite. You know how you're always trying to find your cell phone when it's ringing? Don't you love it? You know, one cell phone rings, a whole room reaches for, you know, pockets and purses and what have you. So now this is the ninja cell phone holder. It attaches your cell phone to your wrist, and when you need it, bang, it's right there. <laughs> you love that? And for those of you really important people, put one on each wrist, right? Real or not real, what do you think? Real. Yeah, you bet you're real. Are you kidding me? SkyMall, oh, and this, this, is, this has got to be the best and the latest. Anyone got a look-see yet? No one's got a look-see? This is the engineering form, right? Right? No one's got a look-see yet? This is not a Bluetooth headset. This is a camera that uploads instantaneously to YouTube or my favorite, favorite streaming site, and I can record my life 24-7. I've had this now for two weeks, and you know what I figured out? I am the boringest person in the world, right? <laughs> My life is not at all interesting. Why? Why do we need this stuff? This is not innovation, guys. Right? This is invention. We do it because we can. Why? Having a clue. But we can. <laughs> but we can. That's invention. That doesn't create value. Right? That fills landfills. But the best definition of, of invention I've, I, I've come up with is how quickly can you move stuff from the shelf to the landfill. Right? The faster you can do that, the more inventive you are. And where's the value? There is none. Okay. We've got to break free of the absurdity, right? <laughs> Not real, but me, I wish it was, to tell you the truth. Um, and if you're like me, the fact that it's Velcro to your head does not mean you won't lose it. You know, trust me. Anyone subscribe to Invention and Technology magazine? So you have to, if you don't, it's one of the, my favorite magazines. I love it. It only comes every couple of months, so you don't get inundated with them. Um, a few years ago, it came with Maxwell Smart on the cover, and my daughter, who was then, must have been 14 years old, saw the issue laying on the kitchen table, and she said to me, Dad, I don't get it. What's this? Is this supposed to be funny or something? And I said, well, he's a secret agent, Mia, you know, and he had a, a, a phone in his shoe. She goes, no, no, I, I figured that much out, but why is he using his shoe and not just using his cell phone? I said, no, no, we didn't have cell phones back then. You don't get it. And by the way, look closely. It's a rotary dial shoe. It's not even push button, right? When the first Motorola brick was introduced, anyone own one of these? The brick? How much did it cost? How much? Over three grand. Yeah, over three grand. Can you believe it? And it was a World War II walkie-talkie, basically, right? It was so cool. It was so cool, wasn't it? What were the projections? For year 2000, not 2010, 2011, year 2000 usage, total, worldwide, cell phones enabled. What were the projections when that phone was introduced in the 1980s? What were the projections? The most outrageous ones. A million, someone said. 10,000. 10 million. 10 million. The single most outrageous projection I found, and it was one analyst, was 100 million. And that analyst was, you know, lambasted. Like, how, how stupid could you be? 100 million. How many cell phones are provisioned today globally? Cell numbers, cell numbers globally. It's over three. It's over four. 4.6. How many people inhabit this planet? Six and a half, let's say. You can run up to seven if you want. Does that math make sense to you? 4.6 billion out of seven? Does it I mean, if everyone, you know, you know over 4.6 is under the age of 12, that means every you know, adult has a cell phone? It doesn't quite work out that way, I understand. But how can you be that wrong? 10 million versus several billion. That's not a rounding error, right? How can you be that wrong about the future? It's not the technology. We understood the technology pretty darn well. What we didn't get was the behavior. 
And that's, as an engineer, that's what you've got to focus on, is how is what I'm doing changing behavior? How many remember these ads? Raise your hand if you remember these ads. The AT&T, you will, right? You will not stop for directions. I mean, I want you to think about when this was. Think about when this was. You'll send a fax. What was this, 1960, 1950, 1970? No. Not even 1980. What year did AT&T air these ads? 93. 1993. And by the way, here's the question. Did AT&T do any of this? No. None of it. AT&T got the technology. It understood that. Right? You will. And AT&T didn't even do it. It's not about technology, you see. It's about understanding the behavior, and the way behavior will change the future. One of the biggest things that Microsoft has done, and I'll tell you, when you when, and this is a behavioral issue, right? It's not a technology issue, but I want you to think about this, think about this clearly. One of the most important things for a company to do, if it's going to keep its corporate lens clear, is learn how to acquire companies. Learn how to acquire companies. I remember having a discussion, this goes back now about probably four years with Larry Ellison. I was doing some work at Oracle. I had a one-on-one -on -one with Ellison. And during the discussion, I said to Larry Ellison, you know, in a very polite way, I said, you know that Oracle is not seen as an innovator. And without getting at all upset or defensive, he said, you know what? I'm OK with that, as long as I have the money to buy those who do innovate. Right? And they've become an acquisition machine. Now, they don't all go well. In fact, they don't mostly have to go well. But all you need is the ability to allow disruption to enter your organization periodically. So getting back to my point, to see Microsoft acquire Skype, to me, is one of the most important and promising things you could see from an organizational standpoint. Now, it's not because it's going to make oodles of money, but you know, back to the innovator's dilemma. It's not about where the profit margin is today. It's about where the market and the behavior is going tomorrow. And the way you influence those behaviors, the way you influence that front end of innovation, is by getting in people's faces, by getting to infiltrate somehow their behavior. And mobile is so much a part of how that's going to happen going forward. And the cloud is not going to be about you know, PCs or post-PCs or whatever. It's going to be about whatever device is on my person, ultimately. Right? That's the device that will enable me to live in the cloud. And here's the amazing thing. We talked about the demographics earlier. Here's a frightening statistic, though. When you look at mobile devices, the peak utilization from a percentage standpoint is that 35 to 54 age category. Those are the folks who are defining behavior. And it's not typically what we think of when we think about the leading edge of technology. So there's fascinating things going on right now. I'm going to try to tie this together for you just a little bit because these generational issues, they're hugely important, hugely important. The second thing I want to focus on here is this notion of uncertainty. Uncertainty plagues us. And the only way around uncertainty is speed. And this is a tough, tough thing to get your, to get your brain around. It really is. It was tough for me to get accustomed to when I first started talking about it. Several years ago, I interviewed one of the senior mentors in the Air Force, John Croker. I wrote about him in the book, In the Innovation Zone. And, and General Croker was actually responsible for teaching doctrine, military doctrine to all the generals in the Air Force. He had a team, it wasn't just him, but his team was responsible for doing this. And he described to me, he described to me how the military looks at uncertainty. He said, you know, the thing about uncertainty is our instincts are all wrong when it comes to uncertainty. I thought, what's well, a fascinating thing? Why are our instincts wrong when it comes to uncertainty? So he gave me an example, right? Let's say you're somewhere in the Middle East, you're driving a Humvee, uh, and you're going at 60 miles an hour on a road that you know is not a safe place to be. Okay, so you want to get the hell out of there as fast as you can. And all of a sudden, the dust storm comes along. You're driving at 60. The dust storm cuts your visibility in half. What do you do? Who's that? Okay, ex-military maybe? <laughs> okay. Most of us, what do most of us do? Slow down. I mean, that's what I would do, right? Now, stay with me too, the more forward-thinking person in the back there. Now, suddenly the dust storm really kicks up, and all you can see is your hood ornament. What do you do? Stop. Do you keep speeding up? 
no, even you're going to stop right now. Because human nature says, hey, you know, I'm going to hit something. I don't want to kill myself. Croker's response, that is the exact opposite of what we want you to do. We want you to speed up. We want you to speed up. So how do you do that? How do you get someone to speed up when every fiber of their being is saying, slow down? You're engineers. What's one way you can do it? What's one way you can do it? Checklist, perhaps, yeah. Technology. GPS, radar, right? Maybe there's ways to give me visibility if I don't have natural visibility. I mean, it's what pilots do, right? Pilots can fly in clouds, no visibility, through technology. But you know what? That is such an easy answer. If you put any one of us in that Jeep, give us a GPS, radar, whatever else, we're still going to slow down. The tough thing to change when it comes to uncertainty is the behavior, the instinct. So if you think over time, take like the last hundred years and think over the last hundred years, what's really changed when it comes to uncertainty? What's changed is the ability that technology gives us to react in shorter and shorter intervals of time. But here's what's neat about this. I call this the uncertainty principle. Here's what's really neat about this is that as the velocity of opportunity, notice I said opportunity, not uncertainty, because they're both the same. The greater the uncertainty, the greater the number of opportunities, right? You've got more opportunities. They just each last for a shorter and shorter period of time. So I need somehow to make the decision in shorter and shorter intervals in order to be able to realize the opportunity. So here's where it gets really interesting. So now you understand uncertainty, right? You understand the intuitive response. There was an economist, if you are at all interested, who wrote about this called Frank Knight extensively in the early 1900s. So let me ask you, now that you know uncertainty, to give me a game of uncertainty. Give me a game of uncertainty, anything, blurt it out. A game that epitomizes, could be sports, board games, anything. A game that epitomizes uncertainty, what is it? Poker. Pinochle. What else? What's that? Minesweeper. Cool, that's a good one. Don't get that one too often. What else? I, you know what I get often? Marriage. People, I don't know what. <laughs> Marriage, I get that a lot. What else? Baseball. Taking out the head of a terrorist organization. That's a good one. I haven't gotten that one before. Okay, all right. Prisoner's Dilemma. Prisoner's Dilemma. It's getting closer. What if I told you, what if I told you that none of these are really games of uncertainty? Prisoner's Dilemma is on the cusp. Why? Why would I say that? Because people often respond with things like, you know, games of chance, you know, roulette or chess or cards or craps. None of these are games of uncertainty. It's why casinos are so nicely decorated, right? What are these? They're games of what? Chance, probability. There are percentages. There are odds. I'll give you a game of uncertainty. Play chess with a three-year-old, right? <laughs> King leaves the board, goes in the other room, will not come back. <laughs> That's a game of uncertainty, right? Why? No rules. No rules. So if we're playing poker, sir, you and I are playing poker. You've got four aces in your hand. You know, you're all in. I'm all in. Moment of truth comes, I show my hand. I happen to have four aces. We're playing with one deck. Okay? What's your first reaction? Pull a pistol out of my pocket. Pull a pistol out of his pocket, of course. I'm a cheat. I'm a cheat. Then he looks at me and says, you know what? He looks kind of honest. Second reaction. Yeah, something's wrong with the deck, right? Something's wrong with the deck's not, deck's not right, okay? Third reaction, I'm honest, deck's okay. Third reaction. Alternate reality of some kind. Alternate reality of some kind. <laughs> Perhaps. Most folks will look at their, at their deck, at, the, at, their, at their hand at that point. Say, do I really have four aces, right? Think about that. Isn't that the total uncertainty always takes? First, we blame someone else, right? It's Madoff's fault, right? It's Wall Street. Chumps, it's their, they're the reason I lost all that money in my 401k, right? Number one. Number two, it's the system. The whole financial global system is absolutely a mess. Get rid of it, right? Third, damn, I should have gone to all cash, right? <laughs> it's me, right? Uncertainty always has that emotional component, which is why I say it's about behavior. It's about behavior. So when you think about uncertainty, what I want you to think about is how it affects you and this lens we talked about, and your ability to truly see beyond 
the present constraints that you inhabit. And the biggest problem here is that success doesn't let us do that. Don't take your eyes off the girl. If she's spinning clockwise, raise your hand. Clockwise. Okay, put them down. If she's spinning counterclockwise, raise your hand. Wow, almost right down the middle. Almost right down the middle. 55, 45 maybe. Okay, here's the deal. The girl you know is not spinning, right? You know she's not spinning. You're seeing silhouettes that look the same from the front and the back. How many of you see her going both clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time, right? Yeah, a few, about 15%, 15%. How many can change her at will? At will. Just like that. Why can't the rest of you do it? And by the way, for those of you that are really smug because you can do it, hold on a second. Hold on. Make one go counterclockwise, got one go clockwise. <laughs> go ahead. Can anyone do it? Can you seriously? Seriously? Okay, I've done this with thousands of people. No one has ever said, I've got to see you afterwards. I've got to see you afterwards. Okay? It, 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 is, it is incredibly difficult for most of us mere mortals to do this. Why? She's not spinning. You're seeing silhouettes, same from front and back. Why is she spinning? Why? And why can't you change the direction of spin? You are a rational, smart person. You're a brilliant engineer that works for one of the most successful companies in the world. Why can't you change the direction of spin? It's a cartoon, for God's sake. Why can't you do it? She doesn't stop. Your brain fills in the gaps. What you have up here is a wonderful pattern matching engine. So think about this, right? Microsoft, think about this. You guys are changing the world. Think about this for a minute, OK? You come in day one to Microsoft. You know, Steve Baum was there to pat you on the back and says, hey, your name, sir, is? Jacob. Jacob says, Jacob, that girl's been spinning clockwise for the past 30 years. What do you think? Jacob says, I like this job. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess, right? Next day, Jacob comes in. A coworker says, hey, what do you think, clockwise spinning girl? Yeah, I guess so. But you don't see her spinning clockwise, Jacob. I mean, how long is Jacob going to last? Eventually, he's going to see her spinning clockwise. It'll happen, right? And then Jacob will say to the next person in line, hey, what about that clockwise spinning girl? Right? It's the patterns that we create that reinforce what we believe about the market. You know what? Those are true beliefs. Remember, I said success creates this phenomenon, not, not failure. This is not failure. This is a, a success-driven phenomenon that creates this. And disruption is the only thing that allows you to get away from that success-driven phenomenon. And if you allow the marketplace to hold you hostage, you do in fact succumb, not just to the innovator's dilemma, but you succumb to the, the worst ailment of any organization, which is you get stuck in time. You get stuck in time. It's not where you want to be, I understand that. It's not where you're going. But I'm pointing it out because it's so easy for all of us, for all of us to encounter. Anyone ever have one of these? Right? I still do. Oh my gosh, the first. Pocketable, it wasn't pocket. I'll tell you why. Pocketable transistor radio. Akio Morita, one of the seminal innovators, I think, of the last hundred years or so, when he brought the first transistor radio to market, Sony did not invent anything. Akio licensed the transistor. I mean, there was nothing inventive in this at all. In fact, they couldn't call it a pocket radio because the thing was too big to put into a standard shirt pocket. So Akio had tailor made pockets for his salespeople with double width pockets, right, on their shirts. Uh, so they could put the thing in there, and marketing said, we'll call it pocketable instead of a pocket radio. And, you know, Sony was great at this. Sony was great. They did it again with the Walkman, right? How many of you own one of these? Oh, I still have my dozen or so Walkmans. I don't know what, I can't bear to, to part with the darn things, right? Remember those small earphones? Everyone said, that's crazy. Earphones should be big, big magnets. Come with a neck brace, right? Because they're so heavy. Right? The market said this is stupid. This is stupid. Of course the market said it's stupid. Because the success was in a different pattern. And it's always going to be the case. It's always going to be the case. The third thing I want to break you free of is this notion of complexity. And, and Dave, you said this. I was so glad to hear you say it. It's about simplification. Markets today are looking for simplification. They're not looking for overcomplication. One of the best examples of this, and I wish Cisco hadn't sort of stopped the, the storyline here, was the flip video camera. Wasn't that a great device? You know, every other camcorder was getting more complex, more buttons, greater zoom, you know, just incredible complexity. And along comes Flip with nothing, with nothing. I mean, Flip got started by selling disposable cameras in drugstores. They were going to compete with Sony? Give me a break. Yeah. And then, you know, 
they ended up getting sold for half a billion dollars, and you know, Cisco decided that that wasn't quite enough of an investment, and two years later got rid of them. Too bad. But it spoke to how the marketplace values simplification. Um, I can't emphasize this enough, because as we move to the cloud, as we move to the cloud, things will just get more and more complex. I mean, I, you know, I live with technology day in, day out, and I am amazed at the degree of pain that we put up with when it comes to technology across the board, across the board, right? App stores, are you kidding me? I mean, it's like walking into a Chinese restaurant with a Chinese menu that's this thick, right? I just want food. Can someone just feed me, please? You know, it's become insane, and it's become insane because it's so easy to do, and in part because of the cloud. So as we move from this supply-driven model, this demand-driven model, there's just infinite, infinite demand for infinite variability, uh, the cloud is going to change every aspect of how we experience the world. Number one, it's going to change economics. Yeah, we understand that. This is the preschool, right? So yeah, economics is, is important to understand, but my dad, the engineer, he put it marvelously. When I was a kid, we're sitting at the table one day, we had this half full glass of orange juice or whatever, I remember it well, and, and dad said to me the proverbial question, right? So, is it half full or half empty, Tom? And I looked at it and I said, ah, got this, got this, got this. It's half full, dad, because I'm an optimist. And he said, nope, it's not. I said, really? He said, it's half empty? He said, nope, it's not. Well, it's not half full, it's not half empty. What is it, dad? He said, it's the wrong size glass. It's like the most profound thing my father ever said to me, ever, ever. I'm just waiting for the moment to use it with my kids. Think about this. This is, this is cloud computing 101. We've been using the wrong size glass. So we say, okay, you know, fine, that's easy to, to, to fix. We'll take the sprawling infrastructure, we'll virtualize it. You know, Dave gave you the, 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 the intricacies of this very, very, very well, very articulately. Um, but that's just the beginning, okay? It's not just about resizing the, the glass. 201, right, the next level, is accelerating the degree to which we can create value. How quickly can we create value? So far, when we've built anything with technology, it's been like going to Ikea, right, to buy an automobile, okay? Bits and pieces here and there, and does that fit, and does this fit, and do we have a standard here, we might have a standard there. This is not the way anyone wants to use technology, but yet we're doing it, right? The app store is sort of the next dimension. It's like this on steroids, okay? I don't need that kind of complexity in my life. What I need is simplification. In 1999, I gave a, a presentation at a very large event, which no longer exists, and at that event, I gave sort of the, the future view, you know, what will the world look like tomorrow, and I showed this example of how we'd pull objects, business objects, out of something, I didn't call it the cloud, but out of something, and we'd pull them together, and we'd create a business overnight by doing all of that, right? Well, we're there today. We can do that, right? We've moved from the on-site software, hardware model to some other model up in the upper right. And you know who's going to own that? This is Cloud Computing 301. The company that owns that is the company that builds the operating system for the cloud. And I really believe there's going to be such a thing. Right? I don't know who it's going to be. Right? Could it be? Could it be? Absolutely. You know, Azure is absolutely as good a contender as anyone else is. But whoever owns the operating system for that cloud owns the cloud and it's still up for grabs. And this is where 301 comes into play. Because 301 says, you know what? Forget virtualization. Just get rid of that middle glass. Because what this is all about at the end of the day is taking all those requests and intelligently refactoring them and putting them on the platforms most appropriate for that particular request. So, you know, we, we've, we've all done this to some degree just from, as consumers, right? You use the platform that's most appropriate to your request. But here's what happens economically, and this is the mind bender, okay? Because today, when you invest and you look at the risk and the potential value from an investment, here's what happens. I'm going to invest at this point, the big white arrow, and I'm going to get a return in that small bracket, as opposed to this broader investment horizon that the cloud delivers, where I can make a very small investment and realize a much larger potential return. Notice, I could also realize greater downside because there's more experimentation. The cloud increases experimentation and it increases the degree to which you can have return. One of the best examples that I've seen of this personally is Animoto. Anyone use Animoto? Right, Hollywood style production. You can create these fantastic videos with all kinds of effects and you do nothing. You throw video clips and some text and some images at this thing and it goes to the cloud and it builds it all for you. And what you end up with is for 30 bucks, what otherwise would have cost you about $30,000 just two years ago, right? 
When Animoto released this, they had 50 servers. They figured that was more than enough. They had to scale in three days to 3,500 servers. That's the chart I was just showing you. You invest a little, and then you increase the investment based on your risk tolerance. You've never been able to do that before in business. We've never had that opportunity before in business. So what will happen over the next five to 10 years is three generations of this cloud evolution. The first, the consumer. The second, the small, medium-sized business, which is where the animotos uh, play. And the third is this enterprise space. And what you will see are entirely different value propositions for each of these. In other words, the, the, the lens that we use to value cloud computing in each of these areas will be completely different than the prior one, completely different. And as we move along that, the differentiation in terms of the variety of offerings that are available in cloud will only increase. And that's the potential energy of the cloud, not the small kinetic energy that we see today. That's the long-term potential energy. Last thing I want to leave you with. We talk about socialization. It's not about socialization. It's about personalization. Socialization is the problem, right? Social networks, social media are the problem. Personalization is the answer. When I was doing research for the Innovation Zone book, I came across this one tidbit, which to me was always sort of the, one of the turning points in my mind. If you cut the last century in half and you look at the Nobel Prizes being awarded, the vast majority before 1950 awarded to individuals, not the teams. Fast forward 1951 to the present day, almost an even split, almost an even split. Collaboration is not just what we talk about. It's what we live, right? For children, this isn't a technology issue, right? This is behavior. Technology is what you don't grow up with, right? For them, this isn't about technology. Adam, my son Adam loves Minecraft. Anyone know Minecrafter, right? So Adam and I play Minecraft when I'm traveling. He loves Minecraft, great building game. A few days ago, I heard him talking to one of his friends, and he said to his friend, he said, um, he said Robin, you're on the wrong server. What the hell is he talking about? Adam's 12 years old, right? What does he know of servers? So I walk over, I said, Adam, What's this server thing you're talking about? He goes, oh, I had to create a server so we could play Minecraft, and you know, I had to change the firewall settings on the, uh, on the Verizon modem. Okay, all right, great, good, that's fine, I got that. But what's a server? It's just the place you go. So what, you mean like the mall? He goes, yeah, it's kind of like going to the mall. You can we hang out at the server. <laughs> it's not technology for Adam, right? For me, it's technology. I didn't grow up with it. For him, it's not technology. The repercussions here are incredible, are incredible. If you plot the degree to which we're aging, you know, we live longer and longer, and you plot against that the degree to which we're working more and more, we will be working after we're dead. <laughs> okay? Right? Your Facebook accounts will be there after you're dead, right? Right? Your Skype number will be there after you, all this stuff will be there after you're dead. Right? You will still exist. Right? But you'll be long gone. Okay? Figure it out. And if you do, please share with me what you figured out. Because I'm trying to make sense of this. This is the problem with socialization. The future is not a solo fight. I know that. It's a collaborative effort, right? But it'll be a personalized collaboration. And this is where we don't often get it right. We don't quite understand what that means. So I'll show you what it means. This is the way I used to play with Legos. Let me show you the way Adam, my 12-year-old, plays with Legos. Lego factory, right? This is a CAD CAM system, for goodness sake. Adam doesn't care. You know, he builds this thing. He personalizes it. He shares it with his friends. You know, for him, it's a collaborative sharing experience. But it's his personal toy. It's his toy. Now, he's on the computer 24 hours a day doing this. And I'll grant you, it gives me my share of concern as a parent. Um, I had the stupidest thing to Adam a few days ago. I've got to share this with you. The, just the parenting advice from someone who is a non-authority and shouldn't be giving it. Um, but I said to Adam one day, Adam, would you get off the damn computer and go watch some TV? <laughs> Anyone shop at Land's End? Personalization at Land's End, right? You can build your own cockies, your own jeans. Best fitting pair of pants you'll ever get in the world, right? You've got to be dirt honest with this. The CFO at Land's End showed me this. I actually shared it with my wife when they were first betaing it. My wife played around with it too. You can build your own avatar and you define everything about yourself from your hair color to your inseam to your waist size, everything, 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 everything. My wife fudged the numbers a little bit, by the way. There was kind of this male-female thing going on there, right? She didn't need to, doesn't, doesn't need to. So I'll show you my avatar, not, not hers. So if you're brutally honest with this thing, you end up with the great fitting pair of pants. <laughs> Go ahead, have fun with it. I looked this way when I was 27, sort of. Uh, this is all in the cloud. They have over 2 million body styles that they match you to 
And as a result, you end up with your own customized pair of, of, of clothes. This is what I mean, socialization with personalization. Socialization with personalization. Socialization without personalization is not, is not the experience that anyone is looking for. Last point. Remember this clip from the Titanic? Right? They see the iceberg, and you know what's wild? They did everything right. They did everything right, and yet everything went wrong. They had a new technology. They didn't know how to behave with this new technology. And when the first officer signaled the engine room to put the screws into full astern, and when the engine room did everything they could to respond, shut the dampers, and in this fateful instant, right there, engaged and reversed the engines, and the Titanic's fate was sealed. Why? Because it was a different technology. It didn't behave the same way. Their behavior didn't accommodate it. Right? It had three screws. If you put them all in the full astern, you lost all maneuverability. And you look at the first mate there, and he's saying, turn, turn. So forget everything I just told you. Just do me one favor. Look at those eyes. See them? Commit them to memory. If you ever see that look of fear, uncertainty, doubt in the eyes of leadership, get the hell out of there. <laughs> this is not innovation. Right? This is not the look of innovators. Right? Innovators understand that it's about behavior. And they understand that the best, that the best is stuff that we haven't yet created. So who said this? Who said it? Everything that can be invented has been invented. Who was it? It wasn't Thomas Watson, although a lot of folks say that. No. Charles Dill, Commissioner of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, 1899. Isn't it wild how arrogant we get? Right? Don't get arrogant. Right? You guys, you're building the future. Right? You are determining the way our children and their children will live. And it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity that you have to do that. But it also requires enormous force of will and the ability to overcome a lot of inertia and momentum. I'll be at the bookstore to answer questions, and I know Microsoft has some books as well for you, so I'd love to, uh, to personalize those. If you'd like to stop by and just say hello. Thank you very much.